Hello and welcome to the Dead Air Dudes. I'm Izzy. I'm Raka. And welcome to the continuing saga series of our true crime slash serial killers. And today we have a special treat for you all. We don't have one. We have two. In fact, we have a tag team. A tag team of terror. Tag team of terror. Welcome back one and all, Dead Air Dudes Nation, once again with another episode, as Rocka mentioned, of the True Crime Series. Here we have Leonard Lake and Charles Ng, okay? They, uh, as we mentioned before, Tag Team of Terror, they met up and they really did a number on a lot of people, unfortunately, right? We give a warning to everyone. We're going to speak about graphic subjects and descriptions of crime scenes and the like, so be forewarned. That being said, let's start off with Leonard Lake, we'll go quick synopses and a quick introduction to, you know, their life and, you know, take it away, Rocco. All right, so Leonard Lake, born in 1945, uh, also known as Leonard Hill. He had a few other aliases um, in San Francisco. All right. So uh, born to a two parent household, but the parents split when he was young. And by all other accounts, six. I think it was six when he was six years old. Yeah, I think he was six, five, six. And by all accounts, nothing traumatic. Wasn't abused, wasn't abducted. Oh, abducted. No undergo any kind of traumatic uh, of violent events. So he was not for want. Um, it was a little odd, though. He had a grandma. And grandma habitually um, encouraged him to have interest in pornography. Yes. So take it for what you want. She taught him at an early age to take pride in the human body, in particularly, you know, the nude body. So he obviously had the propensity and whatever to, uh, or the predilection to, which led to him extorting sexual favors from his sisters, taking nude pictures, and we could just imagine what else he did, okay? He became fascinated and obsessed with pornography, which would lead you know, him in, into the future in his adult life. Yeah. Wait, can, can, can you just imagine grandma coming into the door with a batch of freshly baked chocolate chip cookies, some tall glass of milk, and say, all right, as soon as you nibble away here, get undressed and we're gonna get the Photoshop suite ready. <laughs> get, yeah. Assume the position. I mean, oh, God. I mean... I take it back from when I said that nothing traumatic happened. This is twisted, wrong, and demented. Yeah. So we you know we already started. He was he was starting off on a with a bang. So where would he go? Right to the military. Eventually, as he grew up, he joined the Marines, served two tours of duty, and went to Vietnam. Now, mind you, during his uh his you know his stay in service, he had he suffered a delusional breakdown and received psychotherapy in 1971. He was also diagnosed with schizoid personality disorder. All right, shockingly. But after the breakdown in psychotherapy, he relieved the medical discharge. So now we're gonna leave that for now and we're gonna go real quick to the mad dog, Charles Ng. Raka? Charles Ng, okay, so a little younger, uh, a lot younger, actually, born in 1960. 1960. And in, uh, at the time, British Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. And to a wealthy family. Not, not okay, not average. Well-to-do. He yeah. Yeah, had anything to want. He, his parents had everything. He had money. He had access. He had riches. And since an early childhood, again, take it for what you want. No family members come up and say that he was abused. He was a victim of a violent crime. He was uh, anyway mistreated or uh, suffered any kind of traumatic event. He always, from a young age, displayed bad behavior. Yeah. Whether it be problem. at school, 
stealing, disciplinary, fights, you name it. So here's a kid who had two on for in life, but he was, he was trouble. Here comes trouble. And that's how he was. It got so bad to a point that he was sent off to a boarding school in England yeah. where his uncle was a teacher or a master, uh, headmaster or somebody. So he was sent off across the world because they couldn't deal with his shit no more. And what happened? And there, and there, knowing that his uncle probably put his reputation on the line, knowing that he's in another country, knowing whatever it is, annoying, he didn't give two shits, and he acted out again, and he stole from a classmate, and I'm sure a bevy of other crimes. It's important to note for this story, he's got a predilection with a five-finger discount. Yes. He likes we, to we, we could just you call, call, we could call the cat a cat. The dude is a kleptomaniac. Now, that will focus a lot better into the future of this story. So in, in 78, he was shipped out to, where else? The good old U.S. of A. And he happened to join the Marines. But, of course, not forget, he was born in Hong Kong. He's not an American citizen. But, of course, he said, you know what? I was born in Indiana. Wrote it down. They bought it. They believed it. Hey. So, while in the Marines, he showed signs of anger. He resentment and had problems with authority figures. Right? You know. So much so, they dubbed him what? They gave him what kind of name? His nickname in... in, uh... In the service, was it, was it Mad Dog? Mad Dog. Of course. And what happens? Mad Dog. And, then, and the funniest thing, and what did they do to the Mad Dog? They promoted him to Lance Corporal. <laughs> you got to love it. Wow. Okay. <laughs> and then... It and just, continuing... <laughs> this only ended... I mean... Well, I mean, when he tried to steal weapons, why? Because he wanted to freaking kill a superior officer, okay? Want to shoot a, a double grenade launcher at him or something? So he, he tried to steal weapons and was arrested, and he was, court, was about to be court-martialed. But he escaped. He escaped. Okay? He, he, he is a smart cat. No, because he has documents, he plots to steal stuff. He means he has foresight. He thinks ahead, not just committing the crime. How am I going to get away with it? And you can't escape the fact that he's got some natural born killer in him. That it doesn't need a rhyme or reason. He tastes blood. He smells blood. He wants blood. All right. Now, Back to Mr. Lake. We go back. After he was released from the Marines, he goes and he joins a hippie commune and gets married. Now, within the commune already, let's go back. His obsession with pornography. He started making some amateur films. Okay? And he had, he wanted to have his wife in these films. Eventually, the marriage dissolved quickly. Because she found out, and obviously she wasn't down with that, you know? Because not only was it porn, but it was also S&M and bondage type stuff, okay? So it wasn't, you know, your regular, you know, run-of-the-mill, you know, TNA, so to speak. Mind you, Lake, Lake was exposed to pornography early on. That's all he knows. He had a thing about killing mice with chemicals. He was in the military. He's got diagnosed with schizophrenic behavior and, and mental breakdowns. He's now obsessed with a global nuclear fallout apocalyptic event that he swears is coming. He's joined a commune, which they're probably smoking it up, eating shrooms. I mean, going all off on different directions, totally unsupervised, totally unguided. And now he's making pornographic s and films, including his wife, all of which she's not cool with. Um, 
it's spiraling out of control. So he, like he is spiraling out of control. He gets arrested for car theft. And the just system once again, well, they did not know. But I mean, Jesus Christ. He's released, given a year's probation for car theft. He remarried again in 81 to Clara Lynn Bal yeah, Balaz, who he calls cricket. He met her working in a Renaissance fair. Okay? Now, she actually participated in his pornographic films, okay? So she was kind of down for that in the beginning. She grew increasingly tired, and eventually she left. Now, around this time, in 81, he puts out an ad in a gamer, a war gamer magazine, okay? Feel the stream? <laughs> And who answers the ad but the Mad Dog himself? Dog. Hey, you know what? Mad Dog's got to have a friend, too. All right. So Lake invites his new friend to uh, live in a cabin, you know, where he's renting this from Cricket. So I, I get, I mean, him and Cricket are still, you know, I'm going to use Cricket because her name is kind of difficult to pronounce, you know. So, near, right? Next to the cabin, here's where Lake built his bunker for, you know, the nuclear holocaust that's supposed to happen, all right? Which they call the dungeon, and we come to find, oh, yes, something along those lines, right? Now, at this point, there are rumors already that he had murdered his own brother. Okay. Brother, um, best friend at the wedding. Yes. We're talking about Lake here. Whenever. We want to talk about uh, Ing. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, Lake's best friend at a wedding. Um, a few other people went missing. But you know what? I, you know, we can backtrack to all those crazy things. And as it spirals, as we, we undo the envelope that is their world, it gets crazy on... The date of June 2nd, 1985. So at this time, I think they've not, Aang and Lake have been together for several years now. Uh, together, I mean, uh, living together, bunkered up together, uh, doing things together. So this is a, it wasn't like they just met in that article two days ago. They've been in this cabin house and around and about doing their thing for a while. Yeah, abducting, torturing, raping, and killing people. Okay, and the, and the and, thing is, it is all the people that they knew all these people. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you talk about family members, you talk about friends, you talk about uh, acquaintances, about, you know, and we're talking about families, and we'll all get to that. Um, so they're at this hardware store in San Francisco, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden. Um, a clerk or one of the workers there spots Aang trying to tuck a vice into his jacket. I mean, if you ever had a vice, <laughs> one of those puffy jackets, it's kind of hard to conceal uh, a vice. And they approach him, say, sir, what are you doing with that? And he says, oh, well, I bought it. I paid for it, whatever. So, you know, they demand you the receipts. They give him a hard time. Like, hey, you can't just walk out with a vice. So, Lake drives up to the store and tells, sees what's going on and tells the clerk, hey, you know, I have the receipt right here. I paid for it. You know, my friend paid for it. It's nothing wrong with it. Everything's good. It's a misunderstanding. But the, the workers there don't believe it. And good for them that the little radar went off. <laughs> so they already called the police. The police come. And here's where it gets all screwy. The police probably sniffed something amiss, and they could have just dismissed this thing. And I know we, we sometimes trash the police, and most times they trash the justice system. But here we go. The police kind of like, all right, let me do my due diligence. Buddy, you got some ID? Where's your car? And, and it, oh, of course. If you play a game of telephone or six degrees of Kevin Bacon, all the connect, all the connections happen. He he said, 
he identified himself as Robin Stapley, right? And had a driver's license in that name, okay? The police were suspicious. Why? Because nothing like him. Yeah. And not to mention <laughs> his family reported the person, Robin Stapley, San Diego native uh, citizen, missing for a while. So you're going to present the police with an idea of a man who's been reported missing, who you look nothing like. I mean, there's, there is some misconnection here. As brilliant and smart and devious these people are, uh, they're clearly detached. And so they did a little digger, dig deeper into the car. Said, so, so whose car is this? It's my car. No, it's the car of uh, Paul, Paul Cosner, who had gone missing eight months previously in 19, November 1984. So already, that's 0 for 2, or 2 for 2, whichever one you want to, you know, you want to, you want to say. All right. <laughs> and then it gets stupider, if that is the word. The police searched the car. I think there was some incriminating red mark stains or something uh, spotted around inside the oh, what do they find in the car? They go to the trunk. Mm -hmm. Right? So, I mean, you're already batting 0 for 2. And you go to the trunk and you see a gun with a silencer. Uh -huh. <laughs> Which they say, you know what? Um, we're going to take you away. <laughs> And so, meanwhile, this whole thing, Aang slips out. Aang is not, they're, they're busy with Lake, that Aang is ghost. Yeah. But Aang's, uh, Lake is in the back it's of the police car. Yet again. Slippery little son of a bitch, that, 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 that mad dog. So, of course, now they, the gun is in his. It's one of the victims, also. So you're batting 0 for 3, or 3 for 3 in the, in the cop's case. So they take him in. Now, here is where justice isn't served, okay? Because what transpires next is something out of a freaking movie, okay? Like a James Bond villain, okay? What does he do, Rocco? What happens? He goes so in, they're in, the in the interrogation room. And they confront him with a lot of, uh, a lot of data, a lot of things that don't match up. And they start bombarding the questions. Who, who's your buddy? Where are you staying? How do you know these individuals with the... <laughs> Missing person owned the car. Missing person license plate is in your possession. There's a gun with a, a silencer on it in your trunk. Mm -hmm. you, your buddy was, was held up for, for shoplifting uh, a, a tool. Who are you? What's your deal? What was going on? He find and it, so I don't... Go ahead. You find it admits to it. And well, to his real identity, he admits, and he admits the identity of his accomplice. Okay, and then he says, "You know what? I'm thirsty. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a statement." So they bring him a piece of paper, a pencil, and some water. Take it away. And so he's gonna write a note, supposedly. Not just a confession, but he said he was going to write a note to a loved one or something, whatever. Cricket. But, yes. Um, but unbeknownst to the officers, sewn into the lapel of his collar, mm -hmm. he had made a makeshift homemade cyanide pill. Proceeds to ingest the pill and within seconds, goes into convulsions, foaming at the mouth. I mean, full all-out exorcism. 
and they're desperately trying to stop us. What the hell happened? Nobody knows what the hell's going down. He ends up, um, I guess, almost brain dead, I, I would say. He doesn't live long thereafter, I think four days later. Uh, but he had sewn cyanide pills to his clothes in the unlikely event, and <laughs> surprise, surprise, likely event that he was taken in. They're not going to incarcerate him. They're not taking me alive. System be damned. So then he is where I say that the justice system, you know, justice wasn't served there because this motherfucker took the easy way out, as so many of these guys do. But so the, yeah, they go back to the car. Okay. They finally they find a bill on the cricket's name. His uh, ex wife, second ex wife, Clarolyn. And then they find bullet holes. They find blood splatter. They find a stun gun. And the unused bullets in the car. So now, with that treasure trove of, you know, now they have a, they can go and get a warrant. They can go and find out what, you know, where he lives and what's going on. And here, here's where the shit gets juicy, I guess. I mean, the police approach Cricket and they ask Cricket about Leonard Lake. And, you know, she's open in the beginning. She says, yeah, you know, we were married. We, it was a crazy time, but we were not together anymore. And yeah, there's a cabin and there's a lot of stuff. And she's very helpful to a point. And then I think she's has an element of savvy in her too, where she says, listen, there's some personal stuff there I'd like to get first before you go. Once I get it, you guys can go look through the whole thing. I don't care. And <clears throat> she reveals to them that um, it's, it's videotape, private videotapes that she and Lake had when they were married. It's those tapes that we reference and, and that was it. <clears throat> and she also says, listen, it's, it's pretty far remote. Um, it's gonna take a while for you to get there. It's, it's way out of the way. You know, I mean, she's quite, pretty savvy. They allow her, I think, a, a head start to go get the stuff first before they go, which, why would you do that? I mean, why would you effing care? Is this, yeah, this is, cop's trying to solve a potential murder. Who gives a shoot? I am not there to review porn of you and, and the deceased Lake, or at this point, a sick in a coma, brain dead Lake. I'm here to find some evidence if there's any wrongdoing for these missing people and the freaking gun with a silencer. But they allow her to do it and she goes there. She, when the police eventually go, they realize it's not a convoluted pass. It's pretty straightforward to get to the, to the cabin. And when they get to the cabin, uh, they wonder, did she take more than just videotapes of, uh, of her and, uh, and Leonard? Are there more incrimin Is there anything that was incriminating that she might have been involved or aware of? We'll never know because she was allowed to go in there first, which is like, Forensics 101, are you stupid? Which is, I mean, for, for the good that they did in capturing Lake, <sighs> faux pas, faux pas after faux pas, you know, so. When they finally do get to the cabin though, they, they open up into the cabin, they see, initial impression, it's pretty unremarkable. It was nothing. But I think one of the detectives they did have the, the plans or the, the, the sketches or architecture of the house and they, they compared dimensions. I'm like, this room is a lot smaller than the architectural dimensions of the build. And then as they felt around, and again, this is what movies are made of, a false wall was discovered. And as they went more digging and more exploring, it's like 
room after room behind a room that had a dungeon set up. One room had a setup where you couldn't see any sunlight, but you could see the room next to it. Almost as though somebody could be held prisoner and was allowed to watch somebody else in another room possibly get tortured. Right. And then the other room had like little slits. Maybe you get some sunlight, but you would have no idea what time of day it was or what day it was or any, any kind of contact with the outside world. It was an elaborate labyrinth of torture. And yeah. then it gets even deeper because they find some blood splatter. They find some red marks. They find uh, uh, bullet holes. They find a bunch of weird stuff, but still nothing concrete until they start searching the, the grounds around. This is where it not only is brutal and violent, but there was such madness and sinister methodology with these two that it was then discovered they had hundreds of bones yep. cut up so like a butcher would cut up to pounds. 50 pounds of meticulously cut bones yeah. that would make it very difficult to identify somebody. And it was sprinkled all over the yard like fertilizer. Yeah. They estimate and it could be up to 26 people. Right. So, and unfortunately, as things unfolded in this deep, twisted plot, there were families. You're talking about two or three, or a parent, a pair, uh, two parents, and a child. I think they found for sure at least two young children as part of the remains. Yeah. There were whole families missing. I mean, they abducted families. Yeah. They found wallets, money, jewelry. I mean, what 26 is probably on the low end. Right. They found, yeah, they found typewritten rules for women to follow, okay? For female cap for female captives, okay, they found t pic pictures of twenty one women. Some of them nude, of course. They found, like you said, the the, the fucking like prison cells with with holes and windows in them. They found handcuffs, tools, women's clothing. They found a hand drawn map. Yes. Okay. Like a, a hand on treasure map. All right. <sighs> now, this is how, like you said, I said, twisted. It led to two five gallon buckets. Okay. One of the buckets had the victim's IDs, and the other had Leonard Lake's handwritten journals. From 83 to 84, and two videos documenting the torture of victims labeled the M ladies, okay? Which we come to we come to find out that it's uh Brenda O'Connor, Kathy Allen, and Deborah Dubbs. Okay. Now this is a quote to one of the statement said on the video by Lake himself. If you don't go along with us, we'll probably take you, we'll probably take you into the bed, tie you down, rape you, shoot you, and bury you. End quote. And there's more. I mean, that's, that's, that's just one, you know, disgusting quote of this piece of shit. So. Well, yeah, in, in one of the tapes, Eng was seen telling mm -hmm. O'Connor, you can cry and stuff like the rest of them, but it won't do you any good. Uh, we're pretty cold hearted, so to speak. So, I don't know what other evidence you need. The, the bones and bodies are there. The personal effects are there. There's videotapes of them doing these these acts on individuals. I mean, 
in their closed world where it looks like they never thought they would ever get caught, they did whatever they wanted. Basically, it was Satan's playground. And they taped it and took notation. Oh, well, and drew they, also found, they also found a copy of a couple of books. One in particular was The Collector. I think Lake's whole plan was after the nuclear holocaust, he was going to repopulate yes. the earth with uh, these women. I mean, another quote by Lake. God meant women for cooking, cleaning the house, and sex. And whether they're not in use, they should be locked up. I mean, another one. If you love something, let it go. If it doesn't come back, hunt it down and kill it. Such poetry. So. So here we stand with Leonard, like, deceased. He didn't make it fast four days. Um, they find bits and pieces, more and more of the bodies, more and more of the evidence. But behind the scenes, Aang is on the loose. Aang is, is on the run. He is not captured. Last reports were he flew out to Chicago. Yep. And when they, it seems like Aang was always one step ahead of them. Because when they met the contacts or family members in Chicago, whatever, he would already was gone. And I think uh, they had suspected he had left the country, but they didn't know where. He could have went to England, where they, where the uncle was. He could have went back to Hong Kong. He could have gone anywhere. So in that sense, the, the police system dropped the ball. They're looking for evidence. They're slow to pace. Meanwhile, he's gone. It wasn't until, what did we say, folks? Aang's predilection to stealing shit that it did him in again. He was caught kidnapping. I was not kidnapping. He was caught shoplifting in all God places in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. There he was detained. And this is where things get, you just drop your jaw at how inept the world justice system is. Canada did not want to extradite him. He was, he was charged with uh, uh, more than, uh, I think he was charged with some a murder or some kind of assault as well. But Canada- When he was, when, when, they, when they, they caught him shoplifting, he pointed a pistol at, you know, two security guards. <laughs> a brief struggle, gun goes off. He shoots one, yeah. And then they find, they, they, they overpower him and they arrest him. So he was charged and convicted of shoplifting, felonious assault, and possession of a concealed firearm. And, and I'm sorry, folks, if I'm going to put in my two cents. I'm sorry ahead of time, but I'm going to put it in there. I'm going to have to. So Canada does not believe in the death penalty. So Canadian government did not want to extradite him to the United States because when the feds found out through the wire that he was picked up, they contacted the, the Canadian government and told him everything he's been involved with, with mass murders, serial killings, torture, yadi yadi yadi, and the Canadian government's heart was bleeding, cries were, t- were tearing, said, no, well, we, we can't extradite him because you're going to kill his ass. Holy shit! No kidding, Sherlock! So are you and saying so, the same Canada? This is- listen, no, no, I love Canada. This it's is- my second favorite country to, to immigrate to if I had to. But how the hell do you say no to this? So there's a legal fight between the Canadian government and the U.S. government. Meanwhile, what does Mr. Eng do during the five, six years of his sentence in Canada where he's trying to stave off U.S. uh, uh, return? He reads up 
on U.S. law. Yeah. He's a, she's a shifty mofo. Oh, man. So somehow nearing the end of his Canadian term, I don't know what the feds did. I don't know what was exchanged, but I give him kudos. They worked out a deal <clears throat> that he would be extradited back to the United States. And he went to California where all the crimes were committed. They brought him down there. And it's the first thing Aang does. The food was bad. They gave me drugs for, for travel. I was vomiting. I was mistreated. This man knew in and out how to delay and fray the whole court system to just funnel money after money, appeal after appeal, delays. Everything you could think of, he read well. He was well-versed in how to twerk the, the U.S. system to the point that he actually had a mini victory when he decided and he charged that he would not get a fair trial in San Francisco. So they looked all over the state. They went to different places where they thought maybe nobody knows about him and they could get a fair trial there. And these districts said, we're broke. We're out of money. We can't handle him. So finally, they found a district that would and that, that would not have any bias. They think they could get a fair trial there. And the, the state of California finally said, this has gone on too long. Will incur the charges, prosecute the man, start the proceedings. This dragged on what seems to be forever. And this is a fun fact that I think Izzy's come across and I just came across, I didn't know. The entire length of the trial from beginning to end of Mr. Eng cost more, way more than the OJ trials. In fact, up to this date, uh, date being 1999, the trial of Mr. Eng was the most costly trial in California history. It took 13 years to get to trial. Okay. And what happened is this brilliant mother flower actually screwed up royally where he allowed himself to be called to the witness stand yeah. and he he fumbled over a couple of words he fumbled on some of his answers because his whole stance was he was just going along he did not participate in actual doing this and doing that and 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 killing and raping he didn't do any of that stuff he was just an associate. Yeah. Meanwhile, he drew a picture of what he did in his cell, and they were able to use that against him. He drew it. Yeah. It, he literally drew his confession on the wall. Moron. For all the genius things that he did to stave off judgment, he finally was convicted of 11 counts of the 12 homicides charged six men three women two male infants two male infants and well the jury got uh, deadlocked on the 12th one who get i mean it's not academic at this point and what did he get he got the death penalty and he is i think he's still he's still alive actually still on death row at san quentin prison however you the state of California have not executed somebody in, I don't know, 20 plus 30 years. And so he's on death row. Hit the evil actions of Mr. Hang has cost the state of California, and I hate to just put it in monetary terms, in excess of what, 13, 14 million, 15 million dollars, not to mention. It's closer to 20 million, okay? 20 million dollars, not to mention the grief and pain that he has caused all the victims with his associate who took the cowardly way out uh, with the, the suicide. You can't script this thing. No, I mean, it, it's crazy. He went through 10 different lawyers. I mean, check this out. This is, this is a quote by a, this is what a, a prosecutor who 
didn't want to be mentioned. Before Ng is executed, the amount is sure to rise through the appeals and costs of keeping him on death row for many years to come. Okay, so it's a 20 mil now. I mean, and it could be even higher than that. The justice system, quote unquote, has, in America, has gone haywire. No shit, Sherlock. And, you know. For everything this man has done, for all the convictions, the brutality has laid on people in between two countries, three countries around the world, the amount of appeals, the amount of pain, he's still alive. Yeah, and like Even, I said before, the fact that Lake took, you know, took the way out, he didn't stand for his crimes. He's not, you know, has not able to stand for his crimes. Crazy, crazy stuff. I mean, you got a, a bunker torture chamber, death penalty, death and dismemberment place. You got executions, you got sex tapes, you got torture tapes, you got burnt, charred remains that were cut in meticulous ways so that they couldn't be identified. I mean, you have so much premeditation. They gave, they were, they fed the chickens the bones, the remains of the people. So again, it's rumored to be, well, well he got convicted for 11. Could be the man twenty six. Like I said before, it could even be more than twenty six because we don't. Know, they they found all the freaking cars, you know, in in, in, the, in the ranch or whatever. It's crazy. And and how many more since fleeing in eighty five till his being caught in ninety nine to being caught in in Canada? How many deaths you think followed him all the way through? You don't just turn it off and. And stop. No. You're, you're addicted to this. This is you. You're a hunter. You're a predator. You're an animal. Stole a candy bar and killed someone right after. I mean, it's just, you know, sorry, I don't mean to make light of it, but you, it's crazy. Well, there you have it. Uh, uh, that's our presentation of uh, a new twist on our serial killer tag team of uh, terror. Tag, tag team of terror. The shit they did, you can't script this. It blows your darkest imaginations, and they actually did this. Uh, so without anything else to add, that is the, the continuing unfortunate story of Charles Nung and Leonard Lake in California and the rest of the world. Uh, remember, guys, to like and subscribe, and we appreciate all your feedback. We appreciate, we appreciate everything that uh, all the support that you you give us as we continue to give you uh, craziest content ever. Yeah, if you guys, uh, you know, please like, comment, subscribe, like our content. We'll keep giving you more and more crazy stuff. So, uh, for me, Izzy, for Marco, remember to be vigilant and save the whales. Take care, guys. <laughs>